Good evening. Welcome to the virtual creative writing honors thesis reading hosted by the Kelly Writers House, sponsored by the Creative Writing Program. I'm so thrilled that this can happen, if not in person, in the virtual world. I'm Julia Block, director of the Creative Writing Program. And each year we give a limited number of students the opportunity to write a creative thesis for consideration of honors in English. And the goal is for students to envision and complete a substantial project that serves as the capstone of their creative writing careers here at the University of Pennsylvania. The main body of the thesis consists of an extensive piece of writing. This might be a novel or a novel excerpt, a collection of stories, poems, or essays, a script for stage, screen, or radio, a piece of long form nonfiction or other writing, and also hybrid and cross genre projects that might combine writing with art, video, sound, or even sculpture. Students also preface the thesis with a substantive critical commentary that describes the work and also performs an exercise that reiterates our program's commitment to the value of training writers as readers. Tonight, we're gonna to hear excerpts from many of these projects. We have a downloadable program that represents all of the students in the honors program, and we're thrilled that most of them are able to join us tonight. We're gonna to go roughly in alphabetical order, and several writers will be introduced by their advisors who are also joining us in the Zoom room tonight. And um, I also wanna say a couple of quick thank yous. First of all, to Lisa Funderberg, who curated this event, made sure everyone was able to get online at the right time and choose the right language and provide excerpts and abstracts for our downloadable program. I'm super grateful to Lisa for helping make this happen. I'm grateful to Amanda Silberling for designing our program and other design goodies on social media. Also to David Marcino for technical assistance. And also finally to Zach Cardiner, our fearless engineer at the Kelly Raiders House who is literally making this possible to happen on YouTube at the same time that we are in a Zoom room together. So without further ado, I think we should dive in because we have a lot of readers and we want time to hear from everyone. Their first person I'd like to virtually invite up to the podium is Beth Kephart, who will be introducing work by Charlotte Bausch. Thank you, Julia. Last summer, Charlotte called me to talk about the simmer of an intriguing idea she was pursuing a novel about one Althea Blaine, whose PhD studies in London are cut short by news that her classics professor mother has disappeared. Inspired by a real life disappearance in a very small town, Charlotte, whose beautiful writing I had first encountered during a young adult fiction class, wondered what I thought, whether this might become the stuff of an honors thesis. Absolutely, I said, and so Charlotte became part of a trio of novel writers with whom I met every Tuesday during this semester. Our workshop was a kind and honest place. Our writers, you'll meet together soon, read each other with greatest care, nudged, suggested, enthused, and through it all, Charlotte's novel, Marathon, unfolded, her elegant sentences locking into compelling scenes, her scenes adding up to a propulsive mystery, her story ripening on the vine of her imagination. A timed final prevents Charlotte from being live with us here today, but she has pre-recorded this reading for us. And I'm so grateful that you all have a chance to hear her read. Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte and I'm going to read um, an excerpt from Marathon. Um... Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte and I'm going to read um, an excerpt from Marathon. Um, this section is from just after uh, the main character, Althea, gets a call that her mother has disappeared, and this is her deciding to fly home from London to Marathon to look for her. It occurred to me how alone my mother was in Marathon. Her parents were dead. I'd abandoned her. Dorothy was the only person in Marathon I'd known her to speak to with any regularity. I worried at times that I'd inherit her isolation. 
But in London, you could go out to buy milk and talk to the man at checkout about his daughter, who was applying for university. You could sit down on the tube next to a woman who happened to have the same purse as you. At the National Gallery, you could eat cake in the cafe across from a couple from Yorkshire who called you love. That was the energy of the city, separate lives crashing into each other at odd angles. In Marathon, there was no chance of this. With any person you met on Peach Street, you could have only the same conversation you'd had a hundred times. A half-remembered insult from ten years ago stayed with you the rest of your life. This was the place in which I'd left my mother alone. I took up my laptop and booked the soonest flight to Washington, then Syracuse. For the first time, I used the bank account my grandmother had left me. On the plane, I compiled a list. Every place we'd ever found my mother, every place she'd ever wanted to go. Also, every person I could think of who might want her gone. When I dragged my suitcase through the automatic doors at the airport, Dorothy was standing on the sidewalk next to her car. She wrapped her arms around me. She smelled as she always had, fabric softener and dollar store shampoo. An hour later, the green sign appeared amongst the trees, entering Marathon. The graveyard, tombstones slick and tumbled over, furred with moss. The rotting frames of barns, rising like shipwrecks from the early morning fog. The trailer park, muddy grass littered with ATVs and broken Fisher Price lawn toys. Finally, Main Street, the post office with its garish mural. Norm's old fashioned soda shop, the neon ice cream cone in the window already lit, teenagers in paper hats and aprons scrubbing tables inside. The fountain on the green, a rusty trickle of water spurting from its head. My mother's house was a couple miles out of town, beyond the cracked hem of the sidewalk that ran along Main Street to its vanishing point. The house sprawled across the crest of the hill as if it had grown there. My mother, never much of a landscaper, had allowed grasses and ivy to creep up the foundation until it was a green-gray mass on the horizon. Upstate New York was filled with houses like it, grand and ghostly among the cornfields, remnants of a bygone prosperity. There had once been outbuildings, now eaten by swells of overgrowth and earth. As a kid, I thought the ground here must be full of sinkholes. Everywhere, there were half-devoured barns, the tops of trucks lying atop the grass like they'd been buried, ribs of burnt farmhouses sticking up from the earth. Our house, too, was slowly sinking. Thank you, Charlotte, wherever you are. Okay, our next reader is Juan Botero and her, his advisor, Marianne Kant, was not able to be with us, but she sent me this beautiful introduction that I'm going to read on her behalf. Juan Botero is going to read excerpts from his play and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce him and his work. His play scenes, The Foxes and The Caribou, address problems that Juan knows and has experienced, but he has not written a personal confessional. He has done much more. He has captured cultural patterns and turned them into an analysis of social behavior. He transformed his observations into scenes of embodied knowledge. At first, there was only an ambitious plan to write a play. But as a singer and musician, Juan already had experience of how to create works of art that are going to be enacted. First, he mapped the space in which the play would unfold, then he set time frames. Once he had decided on space and time, he placed characters into this world. He has managed to produce scenes that, on the one hand, successfully use existing performance models as inspiration, operas, ballets, popular TV series, and on the other, to invent a small imaginative cosmos of his own. Writing play texts is unlike writing short stories or novellas or novels. It requires understanding of the dynamics of the stage. A performance is always an ensemble art. It is always a collective endeavor. Juan has captured this aspect as well. And I hope that at some point he will see his scenes played on a stage. Welcome Juan. Hello, um, I'm going to read a little bit from um, my play. It's going to be hard because I'm going to be making voices for two of my characters. <laughs> um, so here it goes. Um, caribou the caribou stumbles in from the side of the stage from which the shouts reverberated. He is tied up in a metal harness. The clippity clop of his hooves walking and the rattling of the metal against his body sounds like a thunderous applause. 
Rise, fair queen, most beautiful damsel in the land, the wielder of eternal power, protector of all that live, laugh, and cry, dear beauty. Caribou, what brings you to my resting place? The prison that has taken my hopes and dreams away, the ground that has been watered and fertilized by my sorrowful tears. My lady, I humbly apologize for bringing more sorrow. It is only out of necessity that I come to you to share my story of pain. None of my attempts have been successful, so I resort to you, all powerful monarch for help. For I, caribou of the Western woodlands, am in dire need of assistance. A time ago, I lived happily with my herd in the small clearing between the crooked and the mossy boulder. We had once been tormented by a silver fox who craved nothing but pleasure. But with the strength of my kind, we trapped him in a crystal prison. Since then, a soft scream from off stage. Caribou squirms along to it, but tries to hold the agony in. Bella does not make much of it. We were happier than any caribou community ever was. Carefree, uncomplicated, simple woodland folk. With the risk, with, oh, sorry, with the rise of this morning's sun, a young fox visited our home. She whimpered and cried, shrill vixen calls. She limped and skipped in painful agony. When we saw this poor being cloaked in the innocent fur of pain and youth, we approached with no caution. A fast-footed youngster was taken first. A bull not much older than I disappeared soon after. I watched my best friend get tapped by her deceptive paws and vanish, leaving behind a silhouette of accumulated dust. Caribou, oh Caro, your story saddens me beyond compare. Continue and tell me how this travesty came to an end. With a heavy heart, I must tell you it hasn't. My dignity was stolen, my community disbanded, my chivalry insulted, my trusting heart was taken advantage of, and I fear I will never be able to find my herd again. But my sorrows don't stop. I have been left alone and betrayed when all that I wanted was love. Another shout from Nicholas. This time caribou mouth Caribou's mouth agonizes along with the sound. The scream becomes Caribou's cries of pain. Dearest Caro, Bella, I am sorry for the distress I have caused, for the pain my shrill screams have inspired in you. You see this harness so tightly wrapped around my body? Yes, what is that torturous device? Exactly that, a torturous device. Once the vixen finished taking away my network of support, she imprisoned me in this harness. This metallic contraption is fitted with miniature iron barbs that puncture my delicate skin through the protective barrier of my luscious fur. Every few minutes, it tightens, pinching me dreadfully and making me cry out most violently. That is why I have come to you with hope that you will help me, free me, aid me in correcting the wrongs committed against me. Thank you, Juan. Also beautiful trees outside the window, contested, con I think contestant for best Zoom background. Next, I'd like to virtually invite Waiki Wang to the podium. I'll start like, I'll stop saying that obsessively virtually invite to the podium. I'd like to invite Waiki Wang to introduce Faith Cho. Hello. <laughs> Faith Cho was a student in my novella class. She came to me with an amazing project about a Korean American family, a multi-generational story of brothers, of cousins, of siblings, of how we keep secrets from our most loved ones and in order to protect them. Yet as a result of these secrets, lose a part of ourselves. As her work changed throughout the semester, I was stunned by her dedication to the narrative and to her characters, all of whom were both personal and fictional um, I want to thank her for her efforts and for following through with a project that from the very beginning started as one thing and became another. And through this process, she improved both as a writer, as a thinker, and as somebody who I truly believe um, brings a level of professionalism to her work. Um, I would like to welcome Faith in reading the beginning of her completed novella. Hi, um, I'll be reading a short excerpt from the beginning of my novella. It's called The Funeral. The sun was indecently bright, almost obscene considering the morose mood of the gathered family. A dark green tent had been erected over the casket and two rows of tacky green felt chairs. In each row, there were only four seats. And so the less important family members stood out in the sun. Claire, only child of the first son, sat in the fifth chair. She imagined what they must have looked like from God's point of view a huddle of people dressed all in black in the middle of a sparse graveyard, a dark green shade over dark green grass. This was her first funeral. She didn't suppose her mind was where minds usually were during such a ceremony, but she hadn't been all that close to her grandfather. 
Claire could only imagine what he must have looked like inside the wooden casket. Park myung soo had been a thin man, tanned to the point he was almost brown. Where his skin folded into wrinkles, he was as dark as the chestnuts he used to crack open with his teeth. He had been going blind, and the curly grayish smoke that occurred in such eyes had always left Claire feeling a bit unnerved. She hadn't gone to his wake. Her parents didn't think she needed to be disturbed to come to Jersey twice in one week. Claire suspected that she hadn't really experienced death yet, not in the way all people were eventually meant to, and she planned on keeping that way for as long as possible. While in college, Claire's dog died. She had asked her parents to cremate the body before she came home. They informed her that the evasive ashes was sitting in the guest room. After two years, Claire still had not stepped foot inside that room, with no idea the size, shape, or color of the vase that carried her dog of 10 years. A quiet sniffle came from somewhere in front of her, but Claire let her eyes drift over to those standing in the sun. She couldn't bear to watch her father cry. Uncle Jay, Aunt Mimi, Stephanie, Tyler, and there in the far distance, Claire caught sight of another woman, a woman she could not recognize, perhaps due to the sunglasses she wore or the thin black scarf wrapped around her head. Claire squinted a little harder, craning her neck a little farther, when she felt a squeeze on her thigh. Her mother shot her a scolding look. Turning around, she saw everyone getting up to place handfuls of dirt, one by one, in the dark hole the casket had been lowered into. Do you see that? But when Claire turned to point the strange woman out, she was gone. Confused, Claire waited until it was her turn to shovel out a small portion of dirt. She carried it to the hole and let the dark soil fall with as much grace as she could. As Claire rejoined her family, she glanced back at the empty space, where she knew she had seen a woman crying. Thank you, Faith. Next, I'd like to invite Karen Ryle to, in, to introduce Caroline Curran. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my genuine pleasure to introduce Caroline Curran, who will read from her short story collection, Ultraviolet Line. Caroline has been writing fiction for only a few years, a fact that continually amazes me. I suppose it would be easy just to say she is a natural, because it's true. Her characters, young women of their, her own generation, are drawn with psychological nuance. As a prose stylist, her sentences are vivid yet clean, resonant yet never mannered, and conscious but not self-conscious. She instinctually understands how to create and sustain narrative interest and tension. But Caroline is more than just extraordinarily talented. She is a worker. She revises and polishes. She knows how to use a suggestion or critique while maintaining the integrity of her own vision. During spring break, Caroline was enjoying a productive writing residency sponsored by Kelly Writer's House at the Clearman Cottage in Washington State when the pandemic shut down the nation. When she returned, she redoubled her efforts, working in continued isolation punctuated by our intense Zoom editorial sessions. Her progress throughout this strange semester is both formidable and instructive. I'm so proud of her project and proud to invite her to read for you this afternoon. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from a story I wrote called Summer 2004. I pedaled alone in the dark. Occasional ribbons of crisp nighttime air passed with indifference, and the breeze cooled the sweat at my upper lip. I switched gears and climbed steep hills, the network of metal cogs creaking beneath me. I found the house easily, 50 yards past the last stop sign, and right when it looks like you're about to hit a dead end, the lip of a driveway. I dropped my bicycle behind a bush and walked beside the gravel toward the house. I squatted at the edge of the tree line, the length of a large garden separating me from the house, ridges of dirt and underneath seeds germinating. Beyond the house, fields of crops and woods behind. Inside, the television was on in the living room. Colored light flashed onto the walls and windows. Chaotic, I thought, and violent, even though I couldn't tell what was playing. Minutes passed and I watched. Then a lamp flicked on in a second floor bedroom and a dark silhouette appeared. Fear bloomed inside my body. The nervous energy of getting what I wanted, what I had come for. I readjusted my footing and twigs snapped under my feet. I lost my balance, landed on my hand. 
and something sharp pulsed in the flesh of my palm. I ignored the pain and watched the figure sit on the bed and gather her hair into a ponytail. I could tell it was Violet, the quick grace of her movements. She went to her dresser, opened a drawer, took something out, a sweatshirt. She pulled it over her head. Everyday movements, the same I might do without knowing I was being watched. It was strange to see her like this, in her own room, where I hadn't yet imagined she could exist. Like when you move and your furniture looks out of place in a new house. Another minute while she moved around, picking things up and putting them down in other places. I knew she was just straightening her room, but from far away, I felt that I was witnessing something sacred. She disappeared for a moment and I felt uneasy, like she would appear behind me and ask me if I was lost, if I needed help. She would somehow know my name and she would say it. Adele, she would say, are you okay? She would be calm, worried about me, not angry, just confused. And I would come up with an explanation, something that made sense, and she would nod and understand. But then she came back into her room and turned off the light. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. I'd like to invite Beth Kephart to introduce Lauren Drake. What a pleasure this is. Um, more than two years ago, Dr. Block introduced me to Lauren, then a sophomore at work on a novel of deeply personal significance. Back then, Lauren joined my weekly gathering of independent study and honors thesis writers, showing up each week with new pages of nearly blinding beauty and harrowing poetic power, and finishing that semester with an abundance of good work. Between all kinds of scientific classes and lab work, journalism, and campus leadership, Lauren continued to work on her novel called Between the Teeth throughout her junior year. And this past semester, she became an integral part of our Tuesday workshop, offering astute insights into the work of her peer, peers while weaving new scenes and tenderness and plot plunge into her own. Lauren's hope has always been to transform some of the challenges she has lived with into a work of meaningful fiction. And Lauren, you have done that. I am proud not just of what you have achieved, but of the intelligent, searching, and quietly relentless way you have gone about your achieving. I'm looking forward to hearing you read. Thanks, Beth. Um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from a chapter where the main character, Ollie, gets into a disagreement with her mother about going to therapy. Gum. Mom says it calmly and quietly. Just say it, Ollie. It's just a word. It isn't going to hurt you. I don't want to. Come on, Ollie. Out. Out with it fast. I can't taste it. Gum. It is vile and awful and wrong, vibrating through every notch in my teeth. I need to scrub it off my tongue. See? Is that so hard? Mom sighs. It's just a little stick. It's nothing, Ollie. I know that, but I can't change how I react to it. I just can't. I think getting some help would be good for me. My lips twitch. That word is still foaming in my mouth. You know, maybe someone who's professionally trained to deal with people like me, if people like me even exist. You don't want me to help? Mom narrows her eyes. That's not what I'm saying, Mom. I just don't want to be like this. I want to get better, and that's why I'm asking you to let me find someone who can help, a therapist or something. To what? Mom whispers. Send you to a stranger? You want me to hand you off to some shrink who's going to tell me she understands you better than me when you're my own daughter. The spoon handle clatters to the floor. You're my daughter. Nothing we've done has worked. You can't help me, not with this. My fingernails dig into my arms, draw blood, dig for some relief from the rage from the fact that I said it. All I want is to help you. I wanna help you so much, but you don't know how. You need to let us in, honey. You need to consider letting God back in too. She huffed out of breath and using your head again. She doesn't get it. I can't reassemble it in the words anyone can recognize. None of that will fix this. You can't fix this, mom. I'm not sure if anyone can. I storm up the stairs. She shouts for me to come back, but I slam my door. I rip the crucifix out of my wall and chuck it across the room. It doesn't break like the last one did. Today, the son of God only leaves a dent in the plaster. I drop to the carpet, rubbing my tongue against the fibers. 
I rake my teeth against it, flip my lips inside out. I need to pull apart my mouth until it isn't the same one that said that word. Scratchy mixes with rust, the carpet patch stains red. Can't stop until the disgusting taste of that word is fuzzy and raw. Everything is too clean, too orderly, too much like how it had been when I left for school. I'm strangled by alphabetized books and folded clothes and home smell. I have to undo it. It has to be undone. The first pile of laundry falls like a building, collapsing on its sides, story by story. Each piece is still too folded, still too neat. Tear each one from the stack and fling it across the room. Coat the floor in t-shirts and panties and stiff pairs of jeans. Folds become wrinkles, all those perfect lines shake apart. Books from the shelves crash down in seconds, scattered with mashed up titles made from their overlapped covers. Plop down in the middle of the homemade tornado. It's not enough, not enough, not enough, never enough. Tommy opens the door, finds me rocking, front back, front back, trying to calm. Bud's next to me. Beefy little arms squeeze tight, squeeze warm. He breathes slow and I copy. We rock together in the dark. His wet eyes blink on my shirt. I hug maybe big brother tight. I want you to be okay, he whispers. I kiss the top of his head. Me too, kiddo. The sounds are thick on my swollen tongue. I just don't know how. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. All right, I'd like to invite Jeff T. Johnson to introduce Briar Essex. Briar Essex's Transcripts or a Provisionary Poetics is an investigation of language operations as they form the book and inform our conception of the body, both textual and fleshy. So an investigation of the book as an ideological structure in open collusion with the ideological structure of language, making that plain, keeping it open, a poetics of non-arrival, of transit and transport. It's been my pleasure and great edification to meet with Breyer along the way to this non-arrival, to receive their dispatches and compare notes. Their seriousness is made substantial by their commitment to play, just as humor and its signal gestures are the levelers of institutional sanctimony. Breyer picked up every thread, then put down the ones whose patterns had not emerged. I look forward to seeing where this poetics and this poet might lead, even as they insist there is no destination. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I'm gonna read three short bits from this longer piece. Um, in this piece, every uh, piece of writing is prefaced with a definition that I'm also gonna give, so. Body, one contrasted with the soul. 12, a united or organized whole, an aggregate of individuals characterized by some common attribute, a common mass. Consider body language as embodied language, what you imagine from knowing the soul of the body, brought together in unison, alliance, aggregate, conversation, and collective. Language given as ephemera, gesture, tone, citation. Words worn on the outside for the beholder to read. Can you know the words as separate if you only read them from a body? How do you hold a body? How do you hold its language? From where do you know a body and its language? The binding commonality of the language is the body. Language is made and carried by the body. Consider the body of language as language you read with the body, what you imagine from knowing the body of the language, brought together in unison, alliance, aggregate, conversation, and collective. Language given as ephemera, gesture, tone, citation, words within the body of language for the beholder to read. Can you understand the language if you read separately from a body? How do you hold a language? How do you read a body? From where do you know a body and its language? The binding commonality of the body of language is what you read on the body. The body makes and carries the body of language. What does it mean to have a body? Reading, noun. One, a single or separate act or course of perusal. Exit the Vietnamese deli on 47th and a man asks me for a cigarette he assumes I just bought. 
I show him a sad bond me by way of response. He says, can I get some of that? Telling him this is dinner today and lunch tomorrow seems odd. I just apologize and return to Bertha, the bike. Pulling away, I realize I don't know if he said man or ma'am. Writing this down, note the geographic location of a single letter making all the difference. Kinship, noun, the quality or state of being in kin. One, relationship by descent, consanguinity. First Philly advice was wipe down your bike after salted streets. The person at 50th and Balt wore cutoffs and I ate a wrap. Dad said, don't spend too much time there, but I trod those stairs last week for a date. Shared a bagel, talked of tattoos and internet trans grandpas. They told me about tea, stepped out to smoke, and I had to pee three times. Sipping coffee the whole time I thought about salt. Thank you. Thank you, Briar. Next, I'd like to invite Kathy DeMarco Van Cleve to introduce Samantha Frisky. Hi, um, I'm thrilled to introduce Samantha. Um, in some ways, I think that uh, she was my mentor and I was the advisee because she was just so exceptional in her writing and her, her she seems to me a, a dramaturg and she was able through this process to remind me how much playwriting is at the heart of so much of my understanding of the stories we tell each other. Her specific story, All the Dead Frogs, um, is I, I hope we all get a chance to see this in action, Sam, because uh, it is in the tradition of the great playwrights, Marie Irene Fornes and Tony Kushner. She, Sam was able in her first, I didn't know this Sam, but it's her first full length play. Um, she talks about and dramatizes the themes of climate change, queer identity, families, reproduction, and biblical plagues in one play and it works much in the same way that America was able to carry a billion themes. Sam um, has written her own uniquely uh, brilliant, insightful piece about human nature and all in front of a giant iceberg on the stage. So it is a pleasure and privilege to introduce Sam right now. Thank you so much, Kathy. At Rise, Noah sits on the edge of an ice-filled bathtub. Charlotte leans against the bathroom door, holding a box of her belongings. Charlotte, Noah, you've been in there a while. Noah, can I? No answer. Charlotte enters. Noah is sitting at the edge of the bath pub, staring at the ice in the tub. Noah, it's an ice bath. Charlotte, I can see that. Noah, Noah wipes her nose against her wrist. Has she been crying? Maybe, voice flat all the same. Athletes have used them after strenuous exercise for decades to ease muscle pain. Even Olympic swimmers, they, Charlotte, you've been sitting around the house all day. I don't think you've been doing strenuous exercise. Noah, we can trace ice baths back to the Greeks, to chirotherapy. Chiro, of course, meaning cold. In London, chirotherapy was not only used to cure stiffness, but also depression. And if we, Charlotte, unless a living mental health professional told you, told you to submerge yourself in ice water, I wouldn't... Noah, I haven't gotten in yet. I, I'm waiting, waiting for the, for the ice to melt a little bit, which is funny given everything. Charlotte, I came in here to get my toothbrush. I was serious about moving out. I mean, I was serious. Noah, you seem serious. You have a box and everything. I'm starting to think that if you just get up and leave, no one will ever know that you were there that you can quite easily cause your own extinction. Charlotte, yeah, maybe. Noah, I think the frogs were right. When they hopped into the gray plot, I mean, when they wanted to cause their own deaths, they took something inevitable and reclaimed it. They took their own extinction and reclaimed it. Like, like the old man whose wife died in a hurricane. That's the argument you were trying to make with the euthanasia, wasn't it? That was the, Charlotte, let's not. Noah, okay. Charlotte, okay. Noah, do you need help packing or? Charlotte, I, I'm almost done. I'll, I just have to get some things and then I'll load up the. 
This isn't for show, you know that, don't you? Noah, I do. Charlotte, the end. Noah, I suppose it is. Charlotte turns to leave, heartbroken, stops herself. Charlotte, did you ever think, Noah, did you ever think for just one second that it was tiring being with someone who always dreaded disaster? Did it ever cross your mind that it could be tiring to love someone who didn't listen to what you were saying because they were too busy waiting for the sound of a far off glacier breaking? Noah, right now, Charlotte, it doesn't feel that far off. Charlotte wants her to have said something more, something better, but she hasn't. Charlotte exits. Noah sits on the edge of the tub for a moment, completely silent, very still. She takes in a breath and holds it, plunges in. Waters and ice cubes spill over the sides in excess. She comes to the surface, screams from shock. The plain black curtain that has been the backdrop of all of Act One falls to the ground, revealing a massive iceberg. Noah immediately resubmerges herself. End of Act One. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. I'd like to invite Chi Ming Yang to introduce Grace Knight. Thank you, Julia. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I am delighted to introduce Grace Knight and her thesis, which is um, a wonderful blend of journalism and memoir. And it's entitled, Me and My Lungs, A College Chronicle of Cystic Fibrosis. Um, Grace has taught me so much about resilience in the face of isolation as someone who has lived her entire life in and out of hospitals with a chronic genetic illness that's largely invisible to the rest of the world. Um, and before I met Grace, I knew very little about cystic fibrosis, um, about how it wreaks havoc on the lungs and the digestive system and how people with CF have to stay always six feet apart to avoid contaminating each other with possibly deathly bacteria. Um, so Grace's meditations on proximity and distance and the very unique bonds of the CF community, I think resonate with us all now, especially in a time of COVID-19. And I'd just like to congratulate Grace and also all of you thesis writers um, for making it through your time at Penn and for moving forward in 2020 with uh, such gusto and creativity. Uh, so I give you Grace Knight. Hi everyone. Okay, so I'm gonna read a part from the beginning of my um, thesis. While in quarantine, I hear echoes of the voices of the CF community I have been interviewing for the past several months. They represent a variety of ages, genders, and levels of disease. Some of them are post-transplant, some are living way past the life expectancy, and some are in their 20s. A handful use oxygen tanks, a couple run marathons, and one is in graduate school. Although each experience is unique, some factors unite us, the very first being our understanding of time. The life expectancy for people born in 1998 is around 31 years old. Although that isn't a number I like to dwell on, it does speak to the power that age has within the CF community. By societal standards, I am a young 22 year old adult, but in CF years, I am old, as statistically, I have nine years left to live. Even though the life expectancy has risen dramatically with scientific developments, each year is an uphill battle because of the damage already present in our lungs. CF is a progressive illness, which means it worsens as patients age. This leaves those that are living into their 30s, 40s, and even 50s almost godly in the eyes of CF patients. These are the people we turn to for guidance. Their stories have shaped how I see my own college journey. Many CF patients experience a decline around college age, and this decline is often associated with a change in perspective. Amanda Varnes, a 25-year-old three-time lung transplant survivor, explains that she became more aware of the debilitating parts of her disease as she aged. She felt a big shift in her first year of college. It was during this year that she had an emergency lung transplant due to a rare fungus that had been wearing down her lungs since third grade. Like Amanda, Tiffany Rich, a 30-year-old lung transplant survivor, also saw a dramatic plummet in lung function due to a bacteria she had been fighting for years. 
While both Tiffany and Amanda would survive college, it was definitely an uphill battle and a turning point in their lives. Living through the rough parts of CF gave both of them a heightened passion for speaking out about their illness and working towards a cure. Tiffany explains that when she was in middle school, she tried to hide her CF, but once the going got tough, she became an advocate for the cause by founding a nonprofit called Salty Sisters with Leah Ferrone and hosting a podcast called Breathe In with Gunnar Esiason, both of whom were fellow CF patients. I watched their podcast every Saturday through my college years. Although Leah would lose her battle with CF in 2018, then gave me hope of awareness and truthful wearing of their hearts on their sleeves. Even though the lows of CF are incredibly difficult, overcoming them is a powerful accomplishment, one that is often interwoven with the ordinary tasks of daily college life. It was this lesson that I would learn as a freshman miles away from my hometown. Thanks, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. All right, we are about halfway through what is usually an epic reading, like epic in, in the good way. And around this time we'd start to like smell the um, smells of the delicious reception in the next room. So I want everyone to just try to imagine that there's a delicious reception waiting for you just outside the room that you're sitting in um, and maybe grab whatever you have nearby. I see people with various drinking vessels. I've got a cup of turmeric tea here. I invite you to go and grab your own delicious snack or, or delicious delectable beverage. Next, I'd like to also invite uh, Kathy DeMargo Van Cleve again to introduce Jessica Lee. Uh, Jessica Lee, amazing Jessica Lee. To, um, I wanna echo what the other advisors have said. This is really extraordinary. And while uh, personally speaking, it's been so great to advise Sam and Jess through this year to listen to all the other work is a delight, uh, especially on this last day of classes. So congratulations to all. Um, okay, so Jess is amazing. And she was able to, she wrote a novella and a um, screenplay, which is kind of my dream come true. And it's about uh, the subject of her uh, novella and screenplay is about a man who returns home, a Cambodian American man who returns home to his um, family in South Philadelphia after his brother's suicide. Um, that's a correct logline of her story, but it is so much more than that. Um, what I love so much about Jess's writing is that she is able to express um, in words a, a both a universality and a specificity of uh, a this Cambodian man's experience to make us both understand and learn. Um, what a joy, again, Jess, to have worked with you on this project. Um, I so much want to read the sentence that made me completely jealous as a writer that I liked it so much, but I suspect it's part of your reading. So I'm going to let you do it. So, but she's, um, she's a talent to watch, as are you all. So, Jess. Thank you so much, Kathy, for the very, very kind introduction. Um, I'm actually not going to read that line, but I'm going to, I might mention it afterwards, you know, um, if I can like find it in, in a document, but I'm gonna be reading an excerpt from the middle of this piece and I hope you all enjoy. It's amazing how used to things you can get in a month. The smell of curry wafting in the house, the sound the donut mixer makes when it's getting through our particularly hard batch of dough. The old homeless man who lives outside our shop, who comes in every Wednesday morning and points to a glazed donut, and we give it to him, no questions asked, no money exchanged. Bo's altar, which now has an updated photo. A picture of him grinning widely next to a car he fixed with Johnny in high school, both hands and a thumbs up. He's wearing sunglasses indoors. It's nice, right? Dad says one afternoon to no one in particular, his elbows on the counter, watching people walk by through the window. Next to him, a half-eaten glazed twist. The summer before I started college, Bo started taking a lot of night drives by himself. He would slip out of our room at around midnight, thinking I was asleep. I'd look at our window and see him taking dad's car and driving away into the moonlit horizon. I would try to go to sleep, only to be awakened at 2 a.m. when he came back and quietly go back to bed. I could smell the cheap cigarettes off him. 
I never bothered to ask what he was doing on these drives. As we grew older, our relationship was mostly based around a don't ask, don't tell policy. We lived our separate lives like planets hovering next to each other, never crossing paths. The night before my move-in day at college, Bo shook me awake at midnight. Want to come on a drive with me, he asked. In my half-awake state, I agreed. We drove through Cambodia town, weaving in and out of the deserted alleyways. I, couldn't, I could tell he didn't have a destination, that the driving itself was the purpose. The sound of the rap radio station Bo religiously listened to and the warm wind running through our hair was oddly comforting. I stuck my head out the window, closing my eyes, letting my vision blur in and out. When we finally stopped somewhere, it was outside the little bookstore mom would take us to when we were younger. He lit a cigarette, inhaling and exhaling, letting the smoke invade the car. Are you excited for college? He asked. I guess, yeah, I said. I played it cool, not wanting him to make fun of me. You're finally getting what you wanted, right? You're leaving. He smiled a little, blowing more smoke out the window. You're going to be all right here, helping mom and dad out alone, right? The tiny amount of guilt I'd been harboring about leaving was released in this hesitant question. He laughed. Of course, he said, turning the music higher. Always. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. Next, I'd like to invite Max Apple to introduce Pear Laufman. Hi, everyone. Pear started with a great imagination. His characters are recognizably his own. During the past two years, he's taught himself how to keep the reader intrigued by those characters. With terrific comic language, he fools you into thinking there's a plot. There isn't. Instead, there's a resident magician always in full charge. I think you'll hear a little of that now. Uh, thanks, Max. Uh, that, was, that was beautiful. Uh, so I'm gonna read something from the last story of my thesis. Um, uh, just a small excerpt from the middle of it. Edgar looks up at me. He's tearing up. It's just so needless. But I tell him that it never is Edgar. Everyone around here needs something. I get up to leave, but he grabs my hand and he pulls me down to his eye level. No, don't leave. You should hunker down. Hurricane Henry's coming. And he pulls me to my knees and kisses my forehead. I look down. I'm using his shins to stable myself as he pulls me into his grief. And we sway back and forth like he is the tree and I'm the brave young squirrel dancing amongst his limbs. We give each other life in this way. He is my shelter and my stability and I'm his pride, his life, his joy. I grip his shins tighter and Jojo snores on the couch with an ice pack taped to his leg. I don't know, is this how one should react when their son loses the ability to dance? This man has lost all sanity. Is that all it takes? A loud noise and a tree root? But I wouldn't know. Sheila and I have no children. Sheila says she will be a good mother and if she has a child with a broke man like me, she is already not a good mother. I don't begrudge her, but once again, and once again, once I tell again, Jojo, I tell Jojo. Her, so. she's equated my dreams with money. Be fruitful and multiply, but you see what she does, how she makes me a sellout. I carry Jojo on my back down to the river. He shows me the clearing at the mouth of the marsh, how he's been sneaking through to practice. The clearing is light and springy, and there's room for me to tuck Jojo in the corner and leap around, flexing my calf muscles, using the dampness of the ground to bounce higher and higher. It's so humid, and I work up a sheen of sweat before settling down in the moss. We line the thicket of trees together, staring up at the road, and when Jojo's dad's pickup truck rolls by, I carry Jojo home. I ruined his ballet career. The least I can do is help him skip school. But Edgar was so sad for his son. Here Jojo is, avoiding him. Your dad loves you very much, Jojo, I say. I need to fix this. I'm the father figure Jojo never had. I palm the back of his head like a basketball in a calming gesture. Jojo recoils, thrusting the back of his head into my lower lip, which splits, and I walk home, spitting blood off the edge of the road. I watch it fall in one pink unified blob and land in the algae with a plunk, an offering to the swamp monster. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Pear. Kitsy Watterson, would you please be willing to unmute yourself and introduce Sarah American? All right, here we go. Kitsy, I think you're muted.
How's that? Okay. I'm delighted to introduce Sarah American. She's an English and cinema majors, cin cinema studies major from Singapore. And Singapore has uh, had an influence in her, her project. In many ways, Sarah's project reflects a time and place between worlds, between yesterday and tomorrow, not unlike where we currently find ourselves. This is where Sarah courageously steps from childhood into the future and the past. She takes us from the presence of what once was, both in memory and geographically, that is no longer there. It's transformed into something new. Yet in reclamation, even of land, she shows us that the essence of what was still exists, or at least it is retrievable to some extent, which Sarah is doing by looking back into its history and bringing it forward. I'm very happy to introduce Sarah to you. She's given me new ways to look at nature and to think about big transitions. So thank you, Sarah American. Thank you, Kitsi. <laughs> um, um, in my thesis, I focus on Singapore's land reclamation, a large scale national undertaking that has gone on for almost 200 years and expanded my country by around 25%. This constant transformation of the country weaves an eternally uncertain feeling into the national consciousness, a sense of unsettled sand, a constantly moving land. One professor has written about Singapore's emerging urban grammar of amnesia, speed, compression, and congestion, which comes with an urgency to make sense of one's relationship to space. In my project, I hope to give a literary form to this urban grammar through a series of short form personal essays. The roots of reclaim can be traced back to the Latin cry out against protest and the old French for to make tame. Singapore's land reclamation is a protest against its inadequate land, a rage against the tides of history and nature for being so miserly, so ungenerous in their carving of the coast. But what of the salty smell of the sea that used to waft through my grandparents' house? Or the defamations that new malls and towering residences bring to memory of cycles to the beach? Protests can be loud and furious, proclaimed through the deafening whir of drills and constant din of construction storming through the country. But they can be quiet too, whispered by a frail, widowed grandmother on her dusty porch to her adolescent grandchild who silently etches grandma's words onto her heart. One day, she'll go to college in America. She'll stumble into a creative writing class in her second year, and she will finally find a pen to write those words down. Chiku. Chiku is the name of a childhood memory where a large lone tree blooms from its center. Around the tree are cousins, sprightly teenagers playing under its lush green canopy digging in the sand pit, late afternoon rays touching their glistening skin. The tree is a chiku tree, one that bears an oval scruffy brown fruit tucked away in several tropical and subtropical lands. It has other names, sapodilla, naseberry, dilly, but it is known as chiku and chiku only to us. A few times a year, the uncles will tell us that the chiku fruits are ripe and mature enough. They take out long poles with a little bag and hook finagle onto the end. Amidst the bellowing laughter of the uncles, we pull the fruits from the tree. We wash their brown hairs off and bite into their flesh. If the abiding image of my childhood is grandpa and grandma's garden, that sweaty, oddly magical place, then the chiku tree is at the center of that sacred world from which all infant joy and tender remembrance radiate out. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, I am really, really excited to introduce Mary Osunlana. Mary Osunlana is wildly ambitious, visually dense, and narratively rich, poetically curious project is just the kind of capstone I expected from a writer who in her first year at Penn took English 10 with me 
and produce the kind of work that is only possible when a student writer possesses the courage to let their imagination really, really soar. And it's often the case like this in English 10 when students at the very beginning of their paths as undergraduate writers take the most risks because they haven't yet internalized all those messages we writers get about limits and expectations. But I also want to say something about Mary's sheer talent as a writer. She's someone who lives so close to language that it clearly just delights her as much as it delights us to read her work. This is work born of hard work, but also work that is also grounded in a love of words. This thesis project is one of those theses that I feel like I didn't simply advise as much as sort of watched unfold and occasionally would like throw books at Mary and watch her walk out of my office and wait for the next draft. I'm so proud of the writer and photographer. This is a really visually rich piece. So if you ever get a chance to see an excerpt, I, I know that you'll just delight in it. Mary has become an incredible writer and photographer this last year of hers here at Penn. And I cannot wait to see what she produces next in the world. Please help me welcome Mary Osamana. Thank you, Julia. Um, so I'll be reading. Thank you so much. That's such an amazing um, introduction. Um, I'll be reading from uh, from my project, which is a multimedia um, anthology of what I conceptualize as film stills. Um, and this is an excerpt from the short story called The Blackbird, um, which is a Southern Gothic fusion horror story. Um, adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe's um, Poem the Raven. Um, I'll be sharing my screen because I have images, so we'll see if it works. Oh no. Doesn't look like it's going to, <laughs> so I'll just read. There is a noise at the door, a scuttling, scraping as if someone was dragging their fingernails all over his father's very rich, very expensive, very vintage ebony doors or something. Suspicious, Richard peeked through the peephole before opening the doors properly. It was past midnight and strange folks outnumbered the normal ones this far down south. Richard didn't see anything and it took him longer than he cared to admit to wipe the grime that covered the glass. A second less hazy look revealed his mother's neglected bed of daffodils, a generous driveway, oak trees with moss whipping violently in the wind and just as he expected, the cat named Delilah who acted like she didn't love him. She watched him with glowing eyes from the end of the driveway and Richard padded over barefoot to scoop her into his arms. Hey, girl, he whispered, stroking her fur. Notice that her hackles were raised. When the visit feeling of eyes stickily trained upon him registered, his hackles raised as well. The voyeur, Mr. Dandridge, a gray-haired and brown-skinned man who lived across the street, struggling with two trash bags that were larger than his frail frame. Evening, Mr. Dandridge, Richard yelled over the wind. Mr. Dandridge continued toward the trash cans, not at all embarrassed at being caught staring. A little late for that, huh? Can I help? Does it look like I need? Mr. Dandridge heaved one black bag into the trash can, held onto the rim for balance and a breath before tossing the other inside. Your goddamn help. Wheezing, he turned back up his driveway. Richard grumbled as he turned to head back up his own. The moment his hands touched the brass knobs on the very expensive, very vintage ebony doors, however, the storm that had teased their little corner of Louisiana throughout the evening finally released her tempestuous fury. Even knowing that the man hated him, Richard turned to make sure that Mr. Dandridge made it in safely, thinking of the octogenarian's laborious looking limp. Through the Spanish moss across the street and behind the looming magnolia trees, Mr. Dandridge's back disappeared into his shotgun house, a door shut in the distance. Richard turned, Delilah fears in his arms, so that his doors could do the same. Richard made his soggy and steady way back up creaky stairs armed with another bottle. He made a pit stop at the back of his father's closet, changed into his dad's favorite brocade robe, sandalwood, leather, and smoking musk wafting up when Richard shifted. So it was with fond thoughts of his father's cigars and gelid mead fresh in his mind that Richard entered the study. He didn't get very far. 
The bottle slid through his fingers, amber liquid, and shards of glass sprayed over his feet. Soaking through the tufted doormat, sat in his father's leather chair was a woman. Red bus cup, big eyes. You'd see this if the video, if the image were work. Um, Falashtad grinned, shifting excitedly in the chair so that it squeaked. The only noise in the silent room until Richard breathed the name, Taiwo. Falashtad's grin ruptured into a smile full of extremely sharp teeth. She said, lovely to meet you again. And this is where we leave Richard. A moment, dear reader, as I establish several things so that you can see for yourself exactly how sharp Falashade's teeth were, so that you can understand why Richard called Falashade by my name, and so that like the storm, so furious outside, you too might demand Richard's blood. Thank you, Mary. Avery Rome, will you please unmute yourself and introduce Juliet Palermo, who I just have to say completed two honors theses, the critical thesis in English and the creative thesis in creative writing, which I had no idea until she just subtly dropped that into an email to me. So extra congratulations to Juliet. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm very happy to pay tribute to my friend Juliet. This is a treat. Juliet Palermo is a writer. I don't mean she's a journalist or a wordsmith or a communicator, although she's all of those things. I speak to her way of looking at the world, of being present. Juliet absorbs the moment, sensitive to tone and nuance, power and pretension. And then she switches angles and looks again. She builds a structure of details and dialogue, rewriting and revising. She is dogged. She wants to get it right, to let words lead her to the truth, to understanding. For her thesis, Juliet scoured multimedia sources from Eve Babbitts to Andrew Solomon to Phoebe Waller-Bridge to help her refine her focus, and pare down and go deeper. She has produced a candid and touching meditation on family, on belonging and growing up, on discovering who you are without, without harming others, on coming of age. Her self-portrait offers a full character, a young woman testing her independence, eager, doubtful, observant, unsure. And the questions she wrestles with are ones we ask ourselves all the time, at any age. What do we take from the past? What does it mean to us now? How can we see our parents clearly as people? Do we even want to? What happens when we seek out new families so we can grow beyond where we were planted? On each page of Juliet's writing, you will see a philosopher probing the boundaries of experience, and you will hear a poet's love of language and music. She gives me some credit for nudging her toward her profession. But really, consider how easily flowers find the sun. Juliet Palermo. Thank you so much. That, that was so nice. Um, OK, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my essay entitled Daddy's Girl. During the summer of 2017, the summer after I had finished my freshman year of college at the University of Pennsylvania, I worked two jobs for a combined total of 40 hours a week. One of the jobs was at Penn and required me to be there at nine. I took an 809 train from Winmore Station in Chestnut Hill to 30th Street Station three times a week. My other job was at a flower shop located 10 minutes from my house, but one that required me to stand all day. If we sat, we got in trouble and provide excellent customer service in a building without air conditioning. Philadelphia summers pulsate with heat. It seeps through the sidewalk to strangle your ankles and it nests in your hair. When I came home from work, I was exhausted. I liked to bask in the cool central air conditioning of my living room and nestle under blankets on the couch with my phone. I did this every night and did not think anything of it. 
but apparently my dad did. One night after dinner, my family was sitting together in the living room watching HGTV. I was huddled under my blanket, half asleep, when my dad started to glare at me. What, what did I do? He shook his head. No, seriously, dad. I can tell you are mad at me. Can you just tell, can you just let me know what I did? He stared at me. Is it because mom put my plate away for me? I'm sorry. He shook his head again. He looked tense. He sat in his leather chair across the room from me, hunching his back and pulling his shoulders to his ears. He crossed his legs and clenched and unclenched his fists. He looked like he was trying to fold himself into a box. My mom joined the conversation. Mark, what is wrong? Tell Juliet what she did and she can fix it. Still, my father said nothing. I ignored him and went back to Facebook. Later that night, when everyone had gone to bed and I was still on the couch watching TV and scrolling through my phone, my father came down the stairs. He stood on the bottom step and looked at me. He took a deep breath. Juliet, listen, are you really going to make me tell you why I'm mad at you? Are you really going to make me say it? I sat up, put the phone down. Yes, I have no idea what you were talking about. I didn't do anything. You, you know what you did, he sputtered. He struggled to find the right words. You come home and then you get under that blanket, your whole body under that blanket and your face gets all relaxed. I can't believe you would do that in front of the family. His face twisted. He looked so uncomfortable, clenching his hands at his sides. What, I screamed. You think I masturbate in the living room to HDTV? What? He began to back up the stairs. Don't you? He asked, voice small, hands limp. No, why would I do that? I don't even do that by myself in my room. Who would do that to HTV? I started shaking and crying. I was a shouting, shaking, crying mess, humiliated by the idea my dad thought I would masturbate in front of the family. The absolute ickiness of that idea astounded me. Is there anything worse than having your dad believe you shamelessly masturbate in the living room with your family sitting there? At that point, my mom came down the stairs. Mark, what is going on? Go back to bed. He left and my mom sat next to me on the couch. She held me while we tried to reason through what had happened. I guess that's what boys do, my mom suggested. Emma came downstairs and joined my mom and me on the couch. Dad thought Juliet was masturbating on the couch. Does anyone masturbate to beach houses? She giggled, then we all giggled. A rough two days between my dad and me followed the incident, but now it's a family joke. When we are all together in the living room, watching TV, one of us will yell, hand check, and everyone lifts their hands above their heads. For good measure, we lift up the dog's paws as well. Then we all laugh, my dad rolls his eyes, and we go back to our phones. Crammed together in the same house because of COVID-19, all of us adults, the topics of sex, death, and alcohol rub up against each other, and we laugh to cope. I worry constantly that my father will hear the buzz of my new vibrator. I pray he has enough cognitive dissonance to assume it is something other than a sex toy, like my ceiling fan. When I told my dad that the first scene in this essay was going to be about the time he accused me of masturbating, he said, oh my God, why? Is this the price of having a writer in the family? Thank you, Juliet. Fantastic. Okay, believe it or not, we actually have three readers left. I guess that's the thing that happens in Zoom. Things go a little more quickly because we don't have to get up and down out of our seats. Um, I'm a little bit sad that we're, we're almost done, but this has been so fantastic. Next, I would like to invite Beth Kephart, please, to introduce Clara Phillips. And what a pleasure it's been to watch all of you and all of your advisors and mentors and co-dreamers. It's really a privilege. I met Clara a year ago while teaching young adult fiction at Penn and oh, what a writer I discovered she was. She could walk you straight into a world with her prose. She turned sentences into theatric energy. Clara is, as some of you might know, a playwright, performer, director. Language is never for her bound strictly to the page. She's dreamed of being a novelist for many years now, and she's dreamed of a place called Allegor. And so when she came to our Tuesday workshops with her Allegor novel in hand, it was a privilege to watch as she worked through new beginnings, new themes, new possibilities. Writing is never a straight line process. Progress is measured as much by what we vanquish as by what we choose to keep. 
And Clara's journey with Alagor took her down a number of roads until toward the end, she discovered for herself what happiness can be when it's found in the projects that have eluded us until miraculously they no longer do. I hated that our Tuesday in-person workshop meetings became Zoom meetings, I truly did. But I will never forget the shine of Clara's smile a few, few weeks ago on my screen when she looked at me from across the ether and used the word joy as she described her week of work. Clara, writing tests all of us. It always will. It's those of us who do not bend to the frustration who find their way through to the other side of the story. And that is precisely what we've done. Thank you, Beth. And I'm gonna be reading a, uh, a little excerpt from the beginning of my thesis. Mom and Sylvia had left the kitchen maybe to look at the locks or light switches, and Brett gently opened the cabinet and pulled out what had caught her eye. Oh, I lost it. It was a bowl, but not a normal one. The sides were paper thin and set with colorful translucent glass, designs emerging from the glazed white clay. The ones she held had oranges hanging from branches, tiny teardrops of green forming leaves. There were six in all, and Brett handled each one and traced her fingers over the designs. There was an ocean, pink butterflies and a luna moth, the moon and sun, an apple tree, and a gaping fish mouth pierced with a hook. She didn't like that one as much. There were glassy blood drops sliding down the side. Each bowl had an H carved into the bottom. She didn't know if these were the work of her grandfather or not. They seemed a little advanced for an amateur potter, not that Brett knew a lot about throwing clay. Still, it had to be crazy difficult to take cut glass and integrate it into a bowl of the sides of that thin. No wonder they were kept apart from the other dishes. These could break easily. Brett put the bowls back, her fingers tingling with adrenaline as she considered the implications of accidentally dropping one. That would not be following rules three and four. And if she was gonna disregard them, she wanted it to be later in the month at least. What are you doing, Sylvia asked, standing in the doorway to the hall. And Brett shut the cabinet hurriedly and stood. Her right foot started to tingle as the blood rushed back into it. She'd been kneeling longer than she thought, but time flies when you're handling fragilely crafted items. Studying pottery. Brett responded, and Sylvia shrugged and turned away. Brett knew that by this point, Sylvia had a strong understanding of the on-the-fly way Brett lived her life, so a budding interest in pottery made as much sense as anything else. Brett liked keeping even herself on her toes. I'm going to read upstairs. See you soon, Sylvia called over her shoulder as she slipped back into the hall. Mom popped into the kitchen as Sylvia left and grabbed the bottle of wine, giving Brett a weak little smile. You tired, sweetie? We did get up early for the drive. Brett wasn't tired but she didn't say so and buried into mom's shoulder for a snuggle. Mom smelled like the lemony hand soap in the bathroom and something smokier that clung to her hair. Brett let her eyes fall closed for a moment, her neck relaxing, and then mom drew back gently. I need to rest up for the drive tomorrow. Love you, Bretty. I'll see you in the morning. Eat some fruit if you're hungry before any of us wake up. Love you, Brett replied, already missing the hug. And then she was alone in the kitchen. She wouldn't want to sleep for a couple hours, if not more. New places jacked her energy up exponentially. But Nan's house didn't have a lot to explore, nothing new to Brett anyways. This was always her least favorite part of the day when she had all the space and time to herself. Brett didn't ponder long. Even if Sylvia didn't want to talk, it would be easier to bear the boredom in her quiet company. So Brett left the kitchen and flicked off the lights. The dark was sudden and eerie and a familiar paranoid urge welled in her chest to turn and confront the stairs to make sure she was really alone, but she quashed it. She'd read somewhere that if you looked once, you would always be looking. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Amazing. Jamie Lee Jocelyn, who seems to be emerging from the bookcases in the Zoom background, would you please introduce Lily Snyder? I sure will. Uh, thanks, Julia. And congrats to all the seniors. Uh, we miss you. We love you. We're super, super proud of you. And I am super, super, super proud of Lily Snyder. Um, one of the most amusing parts of working with Lily on this project has been getting to see the titles of her file attachments on email. Um, so one of them was Dad Angry Sad Coronavirus. And one was just slutty. And one was family trauma. And then the, perhaps the most memorable one, uh, which you will get to hear more about, uh, was those fat titties. 
Uh, and that one actually went missing for a while because my computer somewhat understandably filtered it to the spam folder for like a few weeks actually. Um, now these file names and the affiliated essay titles have been funny and you know at times it's also content that's upsetting but this project has gone so much deeper than that. Um, Lily has interrogated her and our use of comedy are using ourselves as punchlines and using punchlines to protect ourselves. Um, and she's contemplated the psychological and cultural cost of all of this. I'm proud of the work she's done and I'm truly amazed by the pivot that she's made when she was forced to leave Philly and leave the stand-up stage for her family homestead in Maine. Her project meets the moment. She has produced work that will on one hand preserve these weeks and her past in the context of this quarantine. But she'll no doubt uh, do really well with this work as she continues this reflective, complicated, and yes, occasionally hilarious stuff. Here's Lily. Thank you so much, Jamie Lee. It has been such a pleasure. Um, I will be reading a series of excerpts from the aforementioned essay, Those Fat Titties. The wound was up on stage with me. Under the baggy white turtleneck, thin gray undershirt, and tight black sports bra sat my breasts, one of which was bruised midnight blue from its midline to the bottom, the incision on its outer side held together by butterfly stitches and some gauze. Looking at it beforehand in the bathroom mirror, I didn't laugh, I whimpered. The spotlight made me sweat beads in my armpits. The wound on my chest felt especially warm, currents of heat beginning there and spreading to the rest of me from it. It felt like I was standing crooked, like the right side of my body was heavier than the rest. Still, I fired off my well-rehearsed titty trauma set, trying to forget that only three layers of fabric and four feet of air separated my own bandaged breast from an audience of strangers. The cancer scare alone would have been enough. The disfiguration of the biopsy and exhaustion of healing would have been enough. But these were only new accolades in the colorful career my breasts have had in getting through painful bullshit. In some sad way, carrying a throbbing blackened breast around felt right. I could point to it and say, look, someone hurt me here. I am still hurt right now. My first categorically bad memory of someone noticing my breasts happened at 10 years old. I was in the common area between all of the fourth grade classrooms when a boy named Jack called to me across the room. Hey, Twin Towers. In college, big breasts don't make you special, but to some people, they still make you subhuman. This past Halloween, I stood outside of a bar dressed as a fortune teller in a bikini top and long flowy skirt. An acquaintance of mine greeted me, and I greeted him back. So, he asked, looking me up and down, what's it like living with those fat titties? John, if you're reading this, does this answer your question at all? This is the short list. This is a tasting menu from a vineyard that boasts hundreds of acres of varieties of grape. This is an exercise in reading between the lines, dear John. Far before Jack from fourth grade opened up his foul mouth, I knew I had been born into a female body. In fact, none of these boys ever had to say one single thing for me to know. From the moment I had skin, I could already feel the way their world gazed. In many stories, the preteen girl laments being pigeonholed into childhood. I'm not a kid anymore, she screams at her parents, praying each night that God will grant her boobs. She tries strange and inconsequential workouts. She drinks 4% milk and experiments with makeup. She waits impatiently for boys to notice her, for people to stop treating her like a baby, for her womanhood to finally commence. This is not my story. I skipped that waiting step, and if there were a step before that, I skipped that one too. I had breasts long before I had time to have thoughts or wishes or feelings about breasts. I started to look like a woman before I knew that there would even come a time when I'd stop being a kid. 
By the time I'd wrapped my head around it, the day had already passed. Ever since then, I've been waiting for my womanhood to finally let up, even just a little. Spoiler alert, it just gets heavier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily Snyder. Our last reader is Annabelle Williams. Annabelle Williams is going to be introduced by me. When Annabelle Williams approached me about supervising an honors thesis devoted to vampires, the rabid Buffy fan in me practically leapt out of my seat before I could muster the sober, somber professor persona who just nodded thoughtfully and waited a beat to ask, but what do you think you wanna say about the broader implications of vampire fandom? Working with Annabelle on this project was truly working alongside one of the great journalistic minds here at Penn. Annabelle is a writer who never loses sight of the kernel of her idea at the same time that she gives herself grand permission to research wildly. And I was no help with this because much like Mary, I would just, I just kept throwing books at her and I was just as bad as she was about doing research upon research upon research. She also was willing to think dangerously and write nonfiction that pushes the boundaries of well-sourced reporting and searing personal essay. I absolutely admire and adore Annabelle's wit and sharpness as a writer. I would read anything she wrote, but it was a special pleasure to see this project unfold as she discovered all the most pressing and urgent things vampire narratives have to tell us in her brilliant meditations on body image, femaleness, queerness, eating, adolescence, genre, and a whole host of other topics. I want to thank Annabelle for never rolling her eyes every time I use the words steak or bloodless in our meetings and for giving me the best reason ever to watch Hush for the 30th time. Please help me welcome Annabelle Williams. Thank you, Julia. So I'm going to be reading from one of actually the first essay in my thesis. Um, okay. I was born nine pounds, 15 ounces, but after that, I was always skinny. I became a runner and I became skinnier. And once I'd become that thing, I couldn't conceive of unbecoming it. After an injury took me out of running, I stopped going to the gym. But because I couldn't not be skinny, I ate less. Meals became an afterthought as I subsisted on Luna bars and leftovers and the occasional flaccid chicken sandwich from my high school cafeteria. It was around the time that I stopped running that I started watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Watching Buffy's vampires, who at first are adversaries and then friends, lovers, or something in the grayscale, I was equal parts drawn and repelled. I felt like the narrator in Jay Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, speaking about her feelings towards the titular vampire. I did feel, as she said, drawn towards her, but there was also something of repulsion. In this ambiguous feeling, however, the sense of attraction immediately prevailed. I wondered why I wasn't more disgusted by the ick of it all, the bubbling blood and the beaded bodies. The fact that when you really think about it, eating a human being is gross. But now I see some of it had to do with jealousy. These bitches could eat whatever they wanted. While eating for me felt like a chore, something I'd have to remind myself to do with an app on my phone or an antiseptically scheduled lunchtime, they couldn't get it out of their minds. Vampire fictions have some innate sense of the ecstatic pleasure of food. Scenes in Interview with the Vampire show Lestat seated at a banquet table, arranged with a pastel colored delicacy so lovingly placed that it looks decorative. To him, it is. But the pleasures of the human food on the table underscore the pleasures of him consuming his actual food, humans. Rather than seeing food as a chore, vampires seem to embrace their need to identify and orient themselves around it. In that interview with the vampire scene, Lestat shows Lewis how to eat. He seizes a rat and slits its throat and lets platelets slip into a wine glass. That scene should read as grotesque, but instead it feels like a triumph of instant gratification. Food still isn't easy for me. Anxieties about my next meal. How will it taste? When will I eat it? Subsume the one I'm currently eating. Meals are sometimes good and often a utility. The best way I've found to understand my own ambivalence towards food, my desire towards self-control that bleeds into self-destruction is, weirdly, watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. In a dream sequence in the episode Restless, the rogue slayer Faith tells Buffy, there is no body. And isn't that the dream? To exist on some level outside of human limitation, to exert so much control that the body becomes subject to the mind rather than the other way around. Birth is a curse, existence is a prison, yada, yada, yada. But what's so attractive about vampirism as a fiction is that 
for a moment, it can cure us of the ill effects of being alive. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Thank you for leaving in the yada, yada, yada. Thank you to everyone for those incredible readings. These projects are so luminous. Um, I'm thrilled to see all of them come to fruition at the end of this term. I wanna echo what Jamie Lee said, which is that we miss you and we love you and we support you. And I'm super proud of everyone for finishing, not just like finishing at all, but finishing with such ambition and grace and commitment to all of your work. Um, we we're just we're just absolutely thrilled thank you to everyone who joined us on youtube all of our fans thank you for everyone who shared the link with their friends and family and folks who, sh who showed up to celebrate you i'm going to raise my turmeric tea and a virtual toast i invite everyone watching to do the same to congratulate our seniors and with that good night everyone